And I told God, I said, I know that you are for me. Mm. I know that you are for me. And if you allow this to happen to me in some kind of way, it's going to make me better. <laughs> and I don't like it. And I can't control it. And it hurts like something I cannot believe. But I trust you. We are in Dallas, Texas. The bishop is in the house and we are talking about wine for some reason. I'm not sure why Bishop showed up wanting to talk about wine, but that's what's happening. Sorry, Bishop. <laughs> it's communion Sunday. That's what it is. It's communion Sunday. <laughs> so we're talking uh, about a subject. Get us started. We're, what are we going to unpack for an hour? We're going to talk about something that has been uncomfortable for the church to talk about. We talk about victory, I'm the seed of Abraham, yep. a success, abundance, life, prosperity, victory over this and that and the other. We don't talk about crushing. Mm. And the book is called Crushing because the emblem of our faith is an execution chamber. The cross was an execution chamber. Yeah. It, it was years before it became a place of adoration. It was a place of reprehensible judgment on felons and criminals. And our Christ died in the most hideous way mm. on a cross naked in front of all of his disciples, crushed as far as his image was concerned and his affluence and influence shattered as he bled to death, writhing on a cross. And yet we say nothing about suffering. So when people suffer as saints, they do it in silence because we feel obligated to tell each other that we're not going through anything. And I wrote the book Crushing because I believe crushing is just a step to conquering. And once you have gone through your crushings, you become a conqueror, wise and strong because of what you went through. Mm. I don't know that it says this, and I read a lot of this book. I don't know that this says this exactly, but I feel like the, the big subject that we're talking about is why do bad things happen to good people? Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, and so what you're really undoing and what we're really unpacking is this unique dichotomy yes, yes. Of, of, of victory or victor, yeah. you know? Uh, I mean, victim or victory, and 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 you're, you know, we're we're sitting here saying that we pray from a position of victory. The the cross mm. is done. Mm. My dad used to say it this way: God's done all he's ever going to do about the devil. Mm -hmm. Right, right, uh, right. It's called the cross. It was two thousand years ago, and so then we've got this victory position. He, you know, Jesus said, "I have all power," and He lives in us, and all this, and and we have this position of victor right and then crushing happens yes and we don't know how to ha so that's why you're in the house right to start kind of explaining the age-old question I, listen this is so funny to me every time uh on cnn larry king <laughs> would have any person of faith rick warren td jakes Joel yes. Osteen, whoever yes, he would Lord. have Somehow he would always get around and want an answer to that question. Why do, why do bad things right. happen to good people? That's right. He never got that satisfied. I believe he's, you know, I, I believe he never got that answer. No, but he never got it to suit him. And Billy Graham, nobody. Let me say this to you, uh, something you don't know about me, trivia. Uh, I was born June 9th, 1957. Uh, I am my mother's youngest living child. She had a child after me that died and a child before me that died. I was born between two dead children. I was the only one that lived out of those three. I have two older siblings. And I grew up in a house with a father who had kidney failure, who got sick when I was 10 and died when I was 16. Uh, those atrocious, sad, challenging circumstances have so much to do with who I am as a person. Mm. You know, if I had not 
it, she wouldn't have raised me the way she raised me if she wasn't grieving as she raised me, mm -hmm. if she wasn't clinging to me as she raised me. Uh, I wouldn't be a caretaker if I hadn't grown up in a house with a kidney machine. I could run a kidney machine and couldn't ride a bike. So this whole notion of taking care of hurting people is in my DNA. My goodness. Yeah, it goes all the way back to my childhood, climbing up on a hospital bed to shave my father when he was sick or clean him up or dress him or whatever. And so as I sit here today with the ministry to hurting people, it's only fitting that I would write a book called Crushing because I have been crushed. You know, life is crushing. Periodically, it's necessary. Christ was crushed. Uh, grapes are crushed in order to become wine. And the goal is the wine. The goal is what do you have left, not what did you lose. Mm -hmm. And uh, learning how to look to what is before you. The Bible said he despised the shame of the cross, but for the joy yeah. that was set before him, he endured the crushing because he knew the crushing was going somewhere. And I wrote that book to people who have been crushed who are being crushed, not just physically, not just death, not just COVID-19, though that is a horrible thing we should talk about, but crushed in their heart. You know, if, if, I, if I cut my leg, I can get some medication for it and I can take some pain medicine for it. If, 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 I, if, I, if I stump my toe, I can get something and band-aid it up and put some painkiller on it and I'd be fine. If I break my heart, mm. There's nothing to take for it. Mm. And so many Americans are suffering from broken hearts, from family issues, from parental issues, from domestic issues, from family issues, and we have to paint a happy face on because mm. we're Christians. Mm. And, we, and this is the way we look. We're Christians, <laughs> you know, with our crosses around our neck, mm. never knowing that our crosses are in our lives. Mm. Jesus made the toughest altar call that's ever been made. We make altar calls today. God will turn your life around. I don't care how low you are. He'll pick you up. He'll get you together again. If you come to Jesus right now, he'll heal your marriage. He'll bring you through. That's not the altar call Jesus made. Jesus made this altar call. Pick up your cross and follow me. What? Who wants to pick up an instrument of death and cruelty and follow you to a cross? And yet thousands of people followed him. What did Jesus know mm -hmm. about crushing that made thousands of people almost faint in the desert without food to hear him deliver a message about take up your cross and follow me? This, this to me is the epitome of the Christian marriage that, that he takes two fish and five loaves of bread and we know uh, we have an accountant's record of what it is until he crushes it. The more he crushes it, the more it multiplies. And all of a sudden what was accountable is two fish and five loaves of bread and we have absolute metrics on what it was in the bag. The more he crushed it, it fit thousands and thousands of people and ba 12 baskets full left. That's what crushing does in our lives. It, it, it multiplies us, it increases us, it builds us up and it makes us more than we would be had we had sat in the lap of luxury and had everything go well. Okay, let me see if I understand so far. So bad is good. <laughs> Yeah, it was good for me that I have been afflicted. The more they afflicted them, the more they grew. You're, you're only strong because of the weight that's been put on you. Right. You wouldn't be the man that you are today if you hadn't suffered and endured and agonized and put up with stuff and ration, went home and beat the wall and cried in a pillow to stand up to be who you are. People see you on stage and they think, oh, you're Matt Crouch, you know, you're Paul's son. You've always had it good. Nobody has it good. I don't care where you live or what you drive. Nobody makes it through this life without pain. The, the, the call to take up the cross doesn't stop with the zip code. Right. It's, 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 a, it's a universal call from a God who was able to stop the cross, but allowed it to continue because redemption came through it. Okay, we're only a few minutes into this show and we're already kind of getting 
getting the preaches just setting in here just for yeah, a second. Yeah, well, getting you ready got, to go here. I wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it. I, I'm the hero. <laughs> so, um, crushing, God turns pressure into power. Mm -hmm. All right. We're talking about a unique thing. I'm seeing a, a, an image that God simply wears a mask sometimes mm -hmm. so that you don't know it's him mm -hmm. and he's still asking you the question, who do you say that I am? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Is that what we're talking about Absolutely. here? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. You, you know, we've, we've said in the church so often that if we see people going through stuff, it's like, oh, they must be not doing something right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They must right. be, you know, something's wrong in their life. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they just can't, but. Yeah, that's not true at all. Okay. I mean, uh, Job was picked out because he was a righteous man. Right. You know, Christ, there was no gal found in his mouth. He went through the judicial system and was crucified. You, you have to realize uh, Paul craves, oh, that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering. What a strange request yeah. to make. You know, I, I've never met anybody that I thought, oh, I want to suffer like you. You know, Paul says his prayer is all oh, that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. You can't have a resurrection without a crucifixion. There must have been some knowledge. This guy speaks five different languages. He's traveled all over the world. He's trained at the feet of Gamil. He's very experienced. He is a spiritual father in Zion. He's responsible for most of the epistles in the New Testament. And the one thing he asks for is to know him in the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. And really, they sound like contradictions, but the suffering and the power of his resurrection are the same thing because you can't know him in the power of his resurrection if you haven't had crucifixion. Mm. There's something that comes out of surviving that gives us uh, tenacity and fight and, and it has nothing to do with your temperament or how you lash back at people. In fact, some of the people who have the sharpest tongue have the weakest mind. Mm -hmm. To really be strong is to be left standing when the storm is over. Crying maybe, a wind swept, hair all over your head, clothes tattered and torn but still here. Hmm. And, and I think that we need, especially in this hour, that God has allowed this tsunami of disease to attack the world and made everybody, rich and poor, from every tongue and country, go to their room and time out, hmm. proving that, that none of our technology supersedes his ability to control, and I don't, I'm not saying he sent COVID-19, but I'm saying nothing escapes him. He had right. to allow it, right. and, and yet we are still here. My goodness. And it begs the question, why are we still here? What does God have for us that, that he allowed us to survive the crushing to this point? Uh, what am I supposed to learn from this? Not run from it, not lie about it, not succumb to propaganda about it. And everybody keeps trying to say what's gonna happen and the disease seems to be running mm -hmm. things. Who, how you come in the store now is control. How you go shopping now is control. And, and we get down into, you know, these are my rights, but, but, but none of us wanna write to die. Right. We want to have rights, but I want to be alive and I want to have the economy, but not at the expense of losing me. <laughs> I just think, wait a minute, first things first, yeah. God so loved the world. He gave his life for people and uh, to everyone who's suffering from anything. And, and their family's calling saying, you know, I didn't get to hold my mother's hand. I never got to say goodbye. They wouldn't let me in the hospital, uh, screaming and crying on the phone, feeling guilt and ashamed. Maybe you're one of those people 
or related to one of those people or near one of those people, or maybe you're one of those people who died because you couldn't get in the hospital because the hospitals were filled up with them and you lost a loved one to some other disease, or maybe you're going through a divorce, or maybe you've got a child that you poured your heart into and they turned around and broke your heart. There's a lot of ways to be crushed. Maybe you're one of the people who built the business and got it going and it all fell apart or you were working on a job and doing good and now you're back to square one again and you're trying to figure out where you're gonna stay. You, you don't have to be poor to be crushed. You don't have to be Republican or Democrat or Baptist or black or white or Pentecostal. Crushing comes to everyone's life, but it never stays. And I think that when we start to talk about this crushing there, there is a dignity, in, even in suffering. Uh, the kind of dignity that was on the face of Coretta Scott King holding Bernice in her lap and her husband's body up front, the kind of dignity that was on Jackie Onassis, blood all over her dress, but her head was still in the air. There's a dignity that comes up in your spirit that you say to life, you won't break me. And if you're suffering right now and you're on some sort of cross, uh, it's because when this is over, you'll be changed in some way. No longer grapes, no longer temporary. Grapes are one of the few fruits that are raised to be crushed. And Christ was raised to be crucified. But he told the boys, don't give up on me. Three days I'll be back. And that, that I'll be back is why I wrote Crushing. Not to tell you how to squirm on the cross, but to show you how to roll the stone away and get back up again. I know. That's what I want you to know. It's not over, it's not gonna stop here. So wipe your face. I cry too. Pull your hair out of your face, messed up your makeup, it's okay. It's not over. God turns pressure into power. He makes wisdom out of the mistakes we made. Wisdom is made from the elixir from every stupid thing I ever did before I got there. And if I hadn't been allowed to go wrong, I'd never be able to get right. So forgive yourself. I want to talk to you. I, I want to be something on your nightstand or in your bathroom. Not something you just read through on a vacation, but something you just eat in small doses and think about and let it minister to you and speak to the pain in your life. Because sometimes we have a, a pain, a trauma in a place that even the therapist is not reaching. But the Holy Spirit will get down into the crevices of your soul and heal you there. Um, you're doing it again. You're, you're, you're changing the atmosphere in this studio. Um, and you know what I was sitting there thinking while you were just um, talking? Think of how much God loves his people that you'd be sitting in a green room at Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. Yes. And God would start speaking to you the tenets of what this book has become. Yeah. You told me you start writing on a yellow legal pad yeah. as fast as you could, knew that you were not getting a download to speak at Lakewood for that particular service, but that it would become this book. So God, had it downloaded to you. You respond obviously correctly. This book, and it takes a minute to get these things done. Yeah, it does. It, it goes through a process. So God had to speak it when he did so that it would be here for one of the most crushing things in our lifetime. Yes. This is a, a, a weird situation with all of our technology we are really a hurting, crushed people right now. We and are. this book 
was here prophetically on time. Yeah. Unbelievably on time. Uh, T.D. Jakes just happens to be uh, a kid that was told by his teachers he wasn't a very good writer. Some 20 books on the New York Times bestseller, including number one New York Times bestsellers later. That teacher uh, apparently doesn't know uh, much about <laughs> teaching. So the, the big picture here is why do bad things happen to good people? We know that God wants us to be who we are based upon what we're going through. And let me tell you something. You know, every person watching this broadcast and every person talking right now, including me, have been crushed. Absolutely. Okay? It happens. Help us understand that unique dichotomy of what God's doing with this crushing. What? It's, 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 it's a real tough thing to explain, and I want to hear you. First of all, I learned is never try to make sense of it while you're in it. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have to focus on surviving it, not understanding it. Uh, because the crushing is so intense and so personal and so deep that you only understand in retrospect when you look back at it. You say, it was good for me. <laughs> it's over now. It was good. Well, not while you're in it, but after you're through with it, it was good for me that I've been afflicted. Uh, the idea of crushing the grape in its original state, it would, only, it would only last one season. It would rot on the vine. But if you crush it and let it ferment, it would last for hundreds of years. My goodness. And there's something that happens to us when we, when we are crushed that gives us resilience and tenacity that we wouldn't have. I was writing on that legal pad and, and the Lord showed me a vision of people uh, stomping on grapes mm. and then took me to the text that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent and the serpent would bruise his heel. Mm. And when I saw Christ bruised heel, they looked like the heels of somebody who'd been stomping on grapes. And I started to realize that on the cross, he stomped on everything that was against me. Mm -hmm. he, he moved every obstacle that was contrary to me. And that even though I go through things now, that he has borne the grief and carried the sorrows of it. He went before me to lighten the load of it and still suffered me to go through it. And I'll tell you why. What we don't realize is that it is exactly the pain we had that made us who we are. My goodness. It is exactly the neglect or the absence or, or, or I am so grateful for the teacher that said I couldn't write mm -hmm. because that's why I could. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the thing that opposes you in the weight room that causes you to build muscles. Mm -hmm. You know, the resistance training. You know, I don't need the weights to cooperate. I need them to resist me. My goodness. So when life resists you, you get stronger mm -hmm. and you get wiser and, and you turn into something that can be kept and that will, will last. And, and I think it's so important when, when you talk about the suffering church in the book of Revelations at Smyrna and he says, uh, talks about frankincense and myrrh, the incense was roots that were crushed and the aroma only escaped as the roots were being crushed. And there is an aroma that escapes your heart when you're crushed. People who have not been crushed cannot access their emotions well. Wow. Mm -hmm. They cannot uh, verbalize or enunciate feelings well. And sometimes it's dangerous to give power to people who have no empathy. Uh, what we need is somebody who can be touched. That's why Christ came, so that he could be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. Look at Jesus coming to the tomb, to the graveside of Lazarus. Why? I mean, he comes in there and cries about somebody he knows he's going to raise. <laughs> he, felt it. he knows how the story's going in. Why are you crying, Jesus? Mary's crying because she thinks her brother's gone. Martha's crying because you were not there. You come in the room with these people that are crying and you sit with them and you cry with them. Oh, that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering. There is a fellowship, a, 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 a koinonia, a camaraderie that happens 
when you walk in a room with people that are weeping and you dare to weep with them, we, we have fellowship. We, we, we drink from the same cup together. When we have fellowship in the suffering and we know that we are not alone. And I wrote this book because <clears throat> in my pocket, I think my cell phone's in my pocket, I've got 4 million people following me on Instagram alone. I've never had 4 million people following me around. That's not even to mention Facebook and, and Twitter, 4 million, and not to mention any of them. I can take a picture of us and 4 million people see it right now, right now. Never had that in my life. That doesn't stop loneliness at all. Mm -hmm. So we have all of these things that suggest intimacy, but deny intimacy. And it seems like the more people we bring in, the more we're left out. And the worst part about crushing is to be alone, you know? Yeah. And, and I wrote about crushing because people are worried. Mm. People are going off the edge. Yeah. I got a call the other night from uh, uh, a young man who told me that his granddaughter hung herself in her boyfriend's front yard oh. on a tree. Jesus. You think that all of this fear and isolation and bad news didn't play into that right. on top of personal problems and life overwhelmed. And I think that crushing was meant to be a guide through the wilderness of where we are right now. Crushing happens to everyone. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Is that a true statement? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's take a subject like divorce. Yes. That is a crushing. Yes. Um, some people can move on, mm -hmm. find somebody new, and live happily with this new person. Mm -hmm. Another person can be bitter, angry, ugly, and die alone. Right. What did the one do right, and how can you be crushed and end up Oof. not turning into wine? Oh, that's a good question. That's such a good <laughs> question. I hope my answer will match it. What we must realize when we go through divorce is that we are not grieving over the person. We're grieving over what we had in mind. Oh, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Out of 8 billion people in the world, there's nobody that could leave you that would leave you so strung up that you'd spend eight years in pain. Mm -hmm. It's not the person you can't get over. It's what you had in mind that you can't get oh, over. Oh, come on with it. My goodness. And if we can let go of what we had in mind, we can discover what God had in mind for mm -hmm. us. And the difference between the person who can't move forward and the person that can is how quickly we adapt to letting go of what we had in mind. My goodness. My goodness. Well, they That's say that the number one cause of divorce is um, unmet, unmet expectations. expectation. Yeah. 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 As a man thinks, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I thought it would you, be this you, way. You, know, you know what's funny about that is? We have expectations of people that they never agreed to. <laughs> uh, a lot of times we grow up planning a wedding without a groom <laughs> and we're just looking for somebody to play a role in a script that we My already goodness. wrote. Yeah. My goodness. I, and a lot of times we say the same things, but we mean different things by them. Mm -hmm. I love you. You say I love you back. That doesn't mean we meant the same thing by I love you. Mm -hmm. My wife and I talk about going on vacation. And we're both getting excited. We're packing the bags. We're going on vacation. We're getting out of here. We feel like people on a runaway. We're laughing in the car. We're going on vacation. We're actually leaving. We're leaving. You know, we're so excited. The plane's going up in there. We're away. We're away. But when we get on vacation, I discovered that what I had in mind and what she had in mind was two different things. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, you can relate to this. <laughs> Evidently, you can relate to this. My idea, what I packed for and what I expected and what I was up for when we got on vacation was totally different for her. Her idea of a great vacation is not wearing makeup. You know, I don't have to get up at any particular time. I can sleep late. You know, so there she is in the bed. <laughs> And there I am sitting okay. at the bed, rolling my eyes at her, thinking, I thought this was going to be a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> okay? This is not a vacation. We, you could have stayed in the bed at the house. Okay? And I'm totally frustrated. Even though we used the same words, we my expected goodness. 
two different things. And so when you start talking about disappointment, disappointment begins with the expectation that wasn't communicated and you you brought me in to play a role that I never got to read the script. And uh, if I didn't sign off on the script, you have to forgive me if I don't play the role well. It takes you years to figure out what you meant by I love you and what I meant by I want you to be my wife. Hmm. Uh, what what wife means to me has something to do with what my mother showed me, yeah. what I do or do not like about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, what wife means to me has a lot to do with what they were showing on TV during the time. Uh, it has changed in the last 20 years what it means to be a wife. So... Words don't ensure results because words require images. And I wish we could see pictures rather than words because the pictures are true to the vision you have in mind and the word always falls short of the vision. Does that make sense? Yeah. Have you ever produced a movie at all? (laughs) Have you ever done that? You've done a little bit of that. So um, you just fixed that one thing. The question was, let's use the example as a divorce. You know, you can do it right, you do it wrong. How do you do it right? You do it right by letting go of the fact you got to separate the person that left you with the preconceived idea that you had in your mind. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you can separate those two, you can move on. Someone that's stuck in bitterness. Mm -hmm. Let's do a hard one, the loss of a child. Mm -hmm. You've got somebody stuck and they're just bitter and angry at everyone and everything. Mm -hmm. What do you say to them? First of all, I've never lost a child. I won't say that I have. Uh, I grieve with you. I cannot imagine Mm -hmm. the inextricable pain that you must be going through. Uh, I respect that pain. I love my children. I cannot imagine one moment breathing I would be so disappointed if I outlived them. And and my condolences to you. But I also want you to manage that with the reality that somebody never had a child at all. Hmm. Never got to put a diaper on them. Never got to burp them. Never got to hear them say mama. Never got to take a picture of their first step. Hmm. And even though you didn't get to have them as long as what you had in mind, or see all the great moments in front of them that you never got to see, at least you got to touch them and to smell them and to hold them and to have them and to know them. And for those brief moments that they were in the world, you made their world the world it was. And if you're a Christian, you'll see them again. Until then, may the memories and the moments and the loving and the touching and the laughing and the stumbling and the toys left in the floor be the friends that comfort you because you are an exceptional woman or man to have had an experience that other women are praying for and have never had a child at all. There is a whole bunch of people. Let's, let's use um, the issue at hand. Today's season that we're in has to do with racial reconciliation or hopefully getting to that point. That's a crushing. Uh, the COVID is a crushing. And There could be somebody that is thinking, all these politicians that are telling me what to do and how to do and all this, and they are so angry and put off. And uh, how do we, how do we get out of that to become wine instead of just crushed grapes? You know, uh, I had back surgery several years ago between L4 and L5. They did a laminectomy, cut into my spine four inches deep. Uh, It was weeks before I could walk, and even then it was hard. I never would have gone to the mayor to ask him to do that surgery. Mm. I wouldn't have gone to my senator or even my president and asked him to operate on my spine. 
If we let the people who are good at what they do, do what they do and respect them for what they do without allowing other people to get into a conversation who are not qualified to have an opinion, everything would be so much simpler. My goodness. When it comes to our health and our well-being, we don't go to our barber when our tooth is hurting. Mm. If we can get things in the right column and stop allowing people to sell us beachfront property in Arizona, and just go to the people who do what they do and they're not perfect and they're not always right and they don't always have it together but of what we got to work with if i'm gonna have a tooth pull i'd like for you to be a dentist yeah as simple as a tooth and if i'm gonna get my hair cut i'd like for you to be a barber <laughs> so how much more in a pandemic do we want to hear from the best of the best and then make the decisions that we need to make to best protect our loved ones and our family. And I think that that's the beginning. In the absence of truth, you remember, I don't know, I can't remember what you call them, but in geometry class when we were like in junior high school, those little uh, metal things you put down and you draw a circle, yeah. you, you know what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah, the, the, the whole, you can make the circle large or small. The most important thing wasn't the size of the circle, it was the steadiness of the point. If the point was right, the circle would definitely be right. You didn't have to be talented to make a circle if you got the point right. That point is truth. Mm -hmm. Truth holds us to a parameter that creates a circle that's safe. We have lost that truth of what is true. We don't believe in anything. We don't believe in anybody. We don't trust anyone. And if anybody says anything, then there's somebody who comes up and retaliates with some propaganda to create a myth that moves the point and the circle is broken. We've got to get back to a few absolute truths that have nothing to do with being Democrat or Republican or millennial or boomer or black or white. or um, Two plus two is four in Africa, in Saigon, in Italy, in Canada. Truth is absolute. That's why when, when Jesus came, the Bible said we beheld the wonder of his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of truth and grace. If you don't have a truth, then you can't have a grace. Mm. And so I think what we really need today is to get away from all the noise of all the people who are campaigning for us to pick a side and instead of siding with which one of them we're going to go with, we need to make them side with us and get a truth that we dig down in the ground and say, this is true, this is solid, and everything else that's going to go around it is going to go around this truth that I find to be an absolute in my life. Crushing T.D. Jakes is a prophetic. Yeah. It is a prophetically timed book. It is in its season. It is in the right season. And when you when you use all the analogy of this kind of grapes and wine, by the way, do you have a little glass of wine every once in a while? When I'm trying to go to sleep, <laughs> so it's that's okay. all it does to me is make me sleepy. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you, uh, you and Sarita and Lori and I had dinner one time with um, Colin Powell, General Colin Powell way back in the day and uh, I was just making sure you know that you didn't order wine and all that kind of <laughs> no. let's make wine no, let, let's let's have a sparkling water with a lime <laughs> no one thinks how much blood it costs yeah you know uh, that phrase means a whole lot to me because even in the cost of being you no one thinks of how much blood it costs. Mm -hmm. Your grandkids will grab your legs, your wife will hold your arms, and nobody will know what it costs you to be the hand they held. Nobody knows the blood it costs to be who we are. Whether you're Mother Teresa or Annie Lee Johnson, it costs you something to be there for anybody. It costs you something to be the woman you are. And nobody knows what it costs. 
And so you'll always be judged and undervalued and underappreciated by those trolls who hit you up on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and say the most ridiculous things out of jealousy or envy and strife and they don't know that they're writing from one sufferer to another one. It costs all of us something not just the successful, the downtrodden, the person, the single mother who's got three kids and left it alone in a two bedroom apartment and you're working two jobs, making minimum wage. Nobody knows that you're standing there smiling at a checkout counter and your feet are hurting, your back is aching and your kids are waiting on you when you get home and you are tired and exhausted and at the end of your road. The person who goes and treats person after person and walks up down the aisles in the hospital medicating not just the nice but the mean people and the rude people and the obnoxious people and that you're putting your life in danger for somebody who doesn't even seem to appreciate you. Nobody knows the blood that it costs for you to be who you are. And when I write to crushing, I write to every person who ever gave up some of themselves for somebody else. And nobody ever even recognized, no awards, no trophies, no Grammys, no Emmys, no Pulitzers, no New York Times feature. Only God knows how much you were crushed to make the wine you have become. But when I smell it and when I taste it, I can know that it's been through something and experience cannot be faked. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Hmm. Feels like um, there is a truth that I'm seeing clearer because of, of this, that God is looking for, or let, let's say it this way, how do you know you have faith until it's called upon? <laughs> Uh, I'm laughing, you're in my Bible class. <laughs> you're in my Bible class. You know what? Oh my God, I'm going crazy right now. I'm going crazy right <laughs> over here in this chair in front of God and everybody. Because I just taught a Bible class about faith and fear and how they work together and how Christians take the scripture. God has not given us the spirit of fear to mean that God has not given us fear. Fear is a favor if you're in the jungle. There it is. Fear is a favor if you're standing on the edge of a cliff. Fear is a favor if you're about to dive into the ocean. The fear warns you of what is wise and not wise. It's an emotion that we need. Faith operates in spite of fear. People who have faith don't have faith because they have no fear, but the faith rises up and takes the wheel of the car and says, fear, get in the back seat. We're going somewhere. Come on now. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying? Then when you brought that up, it was such, uh, excuse me, y'all, I'm having a moment <laughs> over here because he just gave me such confirmation to my Bible class because what got me, what got me was uh, through faith, Noah being warned of God of things not yet seen, move with fear through faith and yet move with fear, faith, fear, faith, fear. And I started debating that in my head. Come on, and I just taught a Bible class about it. People think your life is a straight line. It's not a straight line up, it's not a straight line down. It's curves and twists and rocks and ridges and, and branches you swung across and creeks you got wet in to get to where you are. It's never just a smooth ride w without dents and cracks and discrepancies and, and, and dysfunctions along the way. I never will forget when I had the final meeting with my doctors and my mother was dying of Alzheimer's and we had to make a decision to disconnect her from life support. And I listened to all of that that they said. And when I finally made the decision, my son looked at me and he said, oh daddy, he said, you're so strong. And I swear, I have never felt so weak in all my life. What comes across to other people as strength only looks like strength because they don't see the bleeding mm. that goes on in your soul. And I would bleed the next 20 years of my life. The next 20 years of my life at a moment that he's looking up at me just thinking, I'm the Hulk or somebody like that. Faith rises up in spite of feelings and it does what it has to do and it responds to life 
however life goes at it. And you don't get to pick what goes at you. You just have to respond the best way you can and make it through this world. I wrote Crushing that we might have fellowship. My sister says Christianity is telling one beggar where another beggar found the bread. And I wrote Crushing to every person who's ever suffered anything, anytime, anywhere in your life, even if it wasn't physical, even if it was emotional, even if it was psychological, even if it was attitudinal, even if it was ministerial. I wrote Crushing to say, I feel you, I got you. I understand that, but there is going to be something beyond that, that. That if you put your time in, as the old folks said, payday's coming after a while. Yeah. I heard a definition of loving God with all your heart is dwelling on His love for you and us. Mm -hmm. Inside of a crushing, is it does, why don't, shouldn't we just dwell on God's love, knowing He loves us, He's really for us, yeah. and this crushing? Yeah. Okay, talk to us a little you, bit about You hit that. it, you hit it. I, I was going through one of the worst moments of my life, and I didn't know how it was going to turn out, and I didn't know if I was going to turn out. But the thing that brought me through was something that you just said. I told God, I said, I know that you are for me. Mm. I know that you are for me. And if you allow this to happen to me in some kind of way, it's going to make me better. And I don't like it. And I can't control it. And it hurts like something I cannot believe. But I trust you that you are for me. And you would never let anything happen to me that if it that it wasn't ultimately going to work out for my good. What you're talking about is knowing God's ways better than you know his acts. Mm. To know that he is for you gives you staying power when you question what he did to you. Mm. It's like a parent who punishes a child and then takes them out for ice cream. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? To have the blessed assurance Oh, thank you, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. To have the blessed assurance that he is for you and that, that he that hath began a good work in you shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. That's, that's that kind of, you know, real church doesn't happen at church. I mean, I'm, I'm a pastor. I believe in going to church. I love it. It's wonderful. I'd rather preach than eat when I'm hungry. But real, real, real church plays out while you're washing dishes or while you're washing the car or driving down the road or you're walking around in the backyard or you're in the bathtub. Real faith is perfected in private places where you and God and God alone are left someplace like Jacob wrestling to know him better than you were before and wrestling to know yourself and God tell you something about yourself that you didn't know. There is nothing as precious as when God tells you, you're not Jacob, but you're Israel. You're not down, but you're up. You're not stupid, but you're wise. Whenever God tells you something about yourself that helps you get through this world a little bit better, that's church. That's treasure. Oh, yes. Seal this beautiful word on our audience as we go out today. The Bible says that Jesus saw the two disciples on the road to Emmaus and that he walked a seven mile stretch with them. <laughs> and over the period of a seven mile stretch, he opened up all of the Old Testament shadows and types of who he was. If you know anything about your Bible at all, there are so many shadows and types in the Old Testament that he could have walked 70 miles, but in seven miles, Jesus explained himself through the major prophets and minor prophets and books of poetry and books of history. And then when they got to the house and they got ready to go in, the Bible said he made as if he would go further and they stopped him because when God starts talking, you don't want him to leave and they invited him to come in the house. And as they sat around the table with him, the Bible said he took bread and lifted up and broke it. 
And suddenly what they did not see on the road and what they did not see in the sermon, they saw in the order of the breaking of bread. There's something about the breakings in our lives that causes us to see God in a way that we would never, never otherwise see Him. There's as much difference between a person who's praising God because the music is nice and a person who's praising God because they've been broken as night and day. Somehow when he took that bread in his hand and he broke it, in the breaking, in the breaking of the bread, the process of breaking, they saw God. My prayer for you is that you would get a revelation of God in the breaking of your life in the cracking of places that you thought would always be there for you, that you would see something about God that you never saw before. And that you would recognize that you are not at the table alone. But he sits with you. And he manages the crushing moments in your life. He knows when you've had enough. And he knows how to stop the bleeding. So right where you are, if you just, just trust him Thank you. and give him the praise. I've got a feeling that everything is going to be all right. Prophetically downloaded to T.D. Jakes for this season, this time, this beautiful book, Crushing. God turns pressure into power. It is in season, it's on time, and it's available for you right now. Thank you, Pastor, for breaking this down. My pleasure. Uh, what, a, what an amazing afternoon, evening. Have a and uh, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> we do this every time. <laughs> we do this every time. I can't figure it out. I love you. I love you back. It's crushing. Get it. Friends, thanks to you, the message of hope and grace found in Jesus is beaming into millions of homes around the world through TVN. So for your gift of support in any amount this month, we'll send you Dr. Robert Jeffress' new book, Courageous, 10 Strategies for Thriving in a Hostile World. So take a moment to visit tvn.org slash courageous10. Thank you.